What is the best evidence for the resurrection? Ooh, Dale Allison and Mike Lacona. Sean has brought on perhaps the two best possible people to answer that question. And what is the best case against it? Well, you might need someone else to answer that. But Dale and Mike are among the best at admitting some of the weaknesses of the historical resurrection case. What will they admit today? We have two scholars with us today who've both written extensively on this. I'm not a scholar, but maybe I can find another YouTuber who has spoken about this extensively. You know, to even the odds. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. If you're a regular here, you've heard me interact with the work of these scholars, as well as directly with the scholars. Good to meet you, Apologia. He's become a legend in the world of atheists. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe indirectly. Dr. Delcy Allison Jr., I have a friend named Apologia online, but he has some interesting questions he'd like to ask you. Okay, so I don't know how to answer this because... While both of these historians believe that Jesus rose from the dead, both readily concede that the historical evidence is not the reason why. I didn't become a Christian because of the evidence for the resurrection. I became a Christian at age 10, mm. and certainly my epistemological processes weren't really developed at that point. I'm a bit of a pragmatist. That is, it just makes sense of my life. It makes sense of my life as I live mm. it. It sort of works, right? The basic uh, foundational faith that I was handed, I've just uh, kept. Now, by the way, I should say that also scares me, right? That scares mm. me because, you know, I am what my parents were. That's not a good reason for anything. Because Dale and Mike are unique among Christian scholars in at least trying not to overstate their case. Buried in this 72-minute interview were a number of admissions that might be shocking to the average evangelical in the pews. And since that's the most important takeaway from this conversation, let's spotlight them right up front. There's a link to the full video in the description lest anyone think I'm taking them out of context. Well, my frivolous answer is that I'm more sympathetic to the atheist. And so I'm always <laughs> asking, what does somebody who not uh, agree with me think? So that, that's where, mm. where we are different. I'm more sympathetic, I think, to the view of the skeptic. I've struggled um, and, and tried to, to think as the skeptic when I was doing my, my, my heavy research on this. So... There's a difference between, you know, what I necessarily believe and what I think we can verify uh, with a, a really good amount of confidence. Dr. Lacona correctly tempers any confidence that the author of John is an independent witness. You know, the author uh, may very well have known some of the some, one or more of the synoptics. He's largely writing independently of them. And if his burial account is independent of the synoptics, then you have multiple independent mm. sources, perhaps. If, perhaps, Dr. Allison correctly affirms legendary development in the iterations of the gospel narratives. I look at, at the, the story in Mark as the earliest and as the least apologetically helpful. And for me, that's another indication that we have some, some memory. Christians are looking at it and, and thinking, oh, we have to say some more things here. Uh, because this story, this bare bone story, just uh, mm -hmm. by itself, uh, is is more ambiguous than we would like it to be. Well, in, in terms of you know uh, embellishments or apologetic uh, stuff being in Matthew, Luke, and John, I mean it's it, it's possible. So I don't rule out what, what Dale just said. Um, it could it could have some of that in there. Dr. Lycona acknowledges the historical ambiguity about the nature of Jesus's burial. But was it a, um, was it an honorable burial? Um, you know, you know, the, the gospel okay. suggests it was, yep. but we can't prove one way or the other. So that's how, what I would say. Dr. Allison acknowledges that if Jesus had been predicting his own resurrection, then one can't also effectively argue that resurrection was simultaneously entirely unexpected by the disciples and thereby immune from embellishment or confirmation bias. Yeah, I mean, you could turn this around, obviously, for a skeptic and a skeptic can say, well, Jesus thought the end was near, so he thought resurrection was near. And so when these events happened, then they put resurrection 
onto it, or they were trying to find the fulfillment of his words in, in, in what happened. For me, you can't just draw this line at the crucifixion and say, these things happened and that's why they thought so and so. I think you have to look before the crucifixion and say they're already living within a certain eschatological scenario. They're already expecting resurrection. Dr. Allison acknowledges that the claim of an appearance to the 500 purported in a creed later recited by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 is historically and apologetically unhelpful. The problem is I'm skeptical of what we can know. I mean, we just have a few Greek words in passing by somebody who wasn't there. I'm not a skeptic by nature. I'm open-minded, but I don't have enough mm -hmm. data to do anything with. So with the 500, I don't know who they are. I can't interview them. I don't know whether Jesus was mm -hmm. up in the sky. I don't know if he was slightly elevated. I don't know if there's a receiving line. I, I simply don't know anything about it. A skeptic could simply say, you know, we have stories of groups of people seeing things in the sky, and we can be a little skeptical of that. So Constantine's army, you know, uh, by this conquer and so on, we have we have that that story, uh, which most historians, you know, wonder about. So th for me, the 500 is just frustrating. It may, uh, I, I'm not being skeptical. I don't want to be reductionistic about it. I'm simply saying, as an historian, I can't do much with it. And that the evidence at hand needn't require a veridical experience. So I agree with Dale there, okay? And that's why, you know, when I define resurrection as I do in my book, it's, you know, it's a very broad, uh, nonspecific kind of definition that could include um, objective visions um, as well as bodily resurrection, okay? Whatever the nature of that appearance was, they perceived that Jesus had been raised bodily, physically from the dead. To me, that makes the most sense. And for hmm. Paul or the apostles in Jerusalem to include that in the oral tradition, if it was an entirely different character than what the rest had experienced, would, would seem unlikely to me. Uh, okay, to, um, to push back a little bit, Paul puts his own account at the end of this list and uh, you said earlier that you think Fair enough. that his experience in acts looks like a vision actually it calls it a vision right at, at one point is yeah. his heavenly vision so if paul can do that i'm not sure why why other people can't do that so a little pushback there yeah i think that's fair dale i think that's a fair answer good answer i don't know again as an historian how you can get behind a vision or get into a vision and decide what all the, the, the causes are and so on. It's, it's very difficult um, and frustrating, the, the limitations of historian, historians. I'm always, I'm always um, going back to something Origen said in his commentary on the fourth gospel, which is, it's really hard often to show things happened even if they did, even mm. if they did. So just speaking as an historian, I don't know how to, to fix the nature of Paul's uh, visionary experience. We were just to look and isolate the appearance to Paul. There's not much we could say about it. In fact, we might be inclined at first to say it's a hallucination and that reports of his experience, conversion experience in Acts, has been embellished to include some traveling companions who took part in elements of, of that experience. So if you just look at the appearance to Peter, you say, okay, well, it could have been a grief hallucination. You look at Paul, maybe an epileptic thing or whatever, you know, if you just looked at those things individually and isolated them, yeah, we, we just can't know much. So I have a problem here because at the end of the day, I say, God raised Jesus from the dead, all right? So I'm in the Christian camp. It's just that I think it's harder to get there with purely historical reasoning. They even come close to an outsider test of faith. If I'm a skeptic, I'm just going to think that all visions are hallucinations, and I know about uh, some collective visions or lots of people have seen Mary, so I'm just going to say the same sort of thing. I'm not in that camp, but I understand the camp. I understand people who look at this and just say, no, it can't be. That's where they start. 
They don't have my worldview. Even though this is the center of Christian theology, that doesn't for me mean that you can establish it historically. Well, if I were a Muslim, and let's just say that the evidence we had for Islam being correct was on par for what we have for the resurrection, and that we did not have that evidence for the resurrection. So if you just kind of flip flopped and they had the evidence for the truth of Islam that we have for Christianity, but we didn't have what we have, would that be enough to persuade me as a Christian to become a Muslim? And I honestly don't know that that's the case because I, I don't like Islam. I, it's not attractive <laughs> in the least to me. So would that uh, the amount of evidence be enough to, to pull me over? I, I don't know that it would be. On the other hand, if it's not happening, wouldn't it be important as historians of early Christianity to figure out how people make up stories about missing bodies and believe them? Dale's right, though. If it, if it is hagiography and you've got it, these reports coming really, really early, then you got to ask, well, what about the really, really early p reports about Jesus' resurrection? If I'm handicapped by my worldview and atheism is true, that's not the atheist problem. That's my problem. And one last admission from Dr. Lycona on his reliance on a minimal facts approach to the resurrection. I recognize that's going to be my proclivity, and that can compromise my um, my investigation as, as a historian. So I like what, what Gary Habermas does with minimal facts, or as uh, Paula Fredrickson called it, historical bedrock. Um, you take those, those facts that are so strongly supported by the data that they have compelled the significant majority, if, if not nearly a universal consensus of, of critical scholars to grant them. And it, it's not so much I, I care what scholars think, but if even skeptics are willing, who, who have a, a, a view contrary to my own, are willing to grant it, chances are it's not just my worldview and my proclivities that are leading me in that direction. If the point of the minimal facts is to rely on what skeptics with a view contrary to his own are willing to grant, why constantly appeal to 75% of New Testament scholars or 90% of New Testament scholars? Without published data, we have no idea what percent of those counted have contrary views. If Dr. Lycona is being sincere here, why count evangelicals at all? Just tell us straight up what critics agree to and give us their names and citations. That should be easy. But none of these massive resurrection books do it. Okay, well, that wasn't much commentary. I let them speak for themselves. But since the spirit of Sean's interview was to have on two scholars who share a conclusion but have vast disagreements on how to get there. Well, we're going to get to plenty of areas of disagreement. I thought my viewers deserved the same. So I reached out to someone who agrees with my conclusion that the resurrection is unlikely to have occurred, but arrives there on quite a different path than I do. Okay. Hi, I'm Camille. Hey, Camille. I've wanted to have you on the channel for a long time, but if people don't know who you are, who are you and why don't they know about you already? Oh, that's a good question. So I'm currently studying classics. If things go well, I'll start my PhD next year. And yeah, I've been lurking for a couple of years, but as of recently, I have a YouTube channel, which I'm assuming is going to be in the video description. Otherwise, you might have seen me on such channels as By Creek and... Nathan Ormond of the Digital Gnosis fame. We don't have time for a Pine Creek or Nathan Ormond video today. We probably don't need to watch the whole video, right? Absolutely, even though I massively recommend it. And even though both of those people, Alison and Lacroix, have a different position, I definitely recommend both of their books. Alison is one of the greatest living experts on the Gospel of Matthew, and I think his book on the resurrection is the best popular level book on the topic that I've read, which isn't Christian apologetics. And I only say that because I've technically never read James Fodor's book. I only know the content through osmosis. And of course, Mike Lacona, I think, is the best apologist who focuses specifically on the resurrection. He's definitely one of the best technically or formally qualified. And his book on the resurrection is the best apologetic book on the topic. So if you read it and you're not convinced, then you're not going to be convinced by anything else. And is it fair to say that you and I have disagreement in the same way that Dale and Mike would have disagreement. 
I think there are just so many ways how you can approach this, so many different explanations that you can draw that I don't think it's a disagreement, right? It's just two different uh, possible explanations. It just highlights how scarce the evidence is and how the evidence is underdetermined, right? So you can just explain it in so many different ways. All right, well, let's take a look at the video. We'll pull out a few examples. All right, sounds good. Dale, you wrote uh, that Jesus did not exist is well nigh incredible. For the record, I also think that Jesus probably existed. If he's invented, that would be pretty unusual because we don't really have examples of fictional characters relevantly similar to Jesus in Mediterranean antiquity. Emphasis on relevantly similar. If you want to hear more about this from me, you can check an interview that I did a while ago with Derek on the Midvision YouTube channel. Even if someone has a very poor evidence of his existence, we can still conclude that he probably existed if the same sorts of people like him usually existed and are very rarely fictional, right? So for example, I will ask Apologia to put a link in the video description. That being said, I think that we can know relatively very little about the history of Jesus, much less than either Lacuna or Ellison thing that we do. Then when we get to the burial, we might start to see some slight differences, but let's find out. Dale, here's what you wrote. I'd love you to comment on this and tell us why you hold this view. You said, quote, I find it likely that a man named Joseph... The reason why McDowell is asking Ellison about Jesus' burial is of course because the empty tomb is one of the pieces of evidence that is supposed to make Jesus' resurrection more probable. And I personally see it the opposite way, because if it's really the case that Jesus' body disappeared, then it's super easy to explain where the belief in his resurrection came from. So if you are a skeptic and you really want to challenge yourself, then try explaining how people became convinced that Jesus was raised from the dead, even though his body was still lying around in his tomb. But if we judge the historicity of the Gospel burial account independently from the question of the resurrection, then I would say that Jesus' body was probably buried as opposed to being left on the cross to decompose. But on the other hand, I don't think that we know that Jesus was buried the way it's described in the Gospels for two important reasons. And I, don't, I think that both of them are massively underappreciated in literature. First, there's a massive contrast between how Jesus dies and how he's buried in the Gospel of Mark. And what I mean by that is that crucifixion was meant to be pretty much the most humiliating and denigrating execution method that was practiced by the Romans. But then in the Gospels, Jesus is buried essentially as royalty. And what I mean by that is that he's placed in a tomb cut into a rock and rock-cut tombs were very, very expensive, and only the wealthiest elites could afford them. And some of the best-known parallels to the tomb described in the Gospels that we know are tombs of royal family members. So just ask yourself, what happened to the two criminals who were supposedly crucified with Jesus, assuming that they didn't have families in Jerusalem to bury them? Were they also given basically a royal burial? No, of course not. And we actually have later sources about how burials of criminals were arranged in first century Jerusalem. And of course, what they show is very, very different. It turns out that there was a common plot of land that was set aside for burial of criminals. So if Jesus wasn't from Jerusalem and he didn't have family there to take care of his burial, he was most probably buried in his communal graveyard in a trench grave. And it seems that later Gospels are aware of this historical implausibility, and it seems that they take steps to fix it. In fact, different canonical Gospels propose pretty much two different ways of fixing it. First, the Gospel of Matthew claims that the tomb was owned by Joseph of Arimathea, so that it makes sense for Joseph to use that specific tomb. And of course, the Gospel of Mark doesn't say that. And second, the Gospel of John claims that the tomb was used because there was a time constraint to bury Jesus before the Sabbath. And the tomb just happened to be nearby. And, of course, the Gospel of Mark doesn't say that either. But neither of these two fixes really work. Because, first of all, there wouldn't be any time constraint. Because, of course, you don't have to wait for a crucifixion criminal to die to start arranging this burial. As soon as you learn that there is going to be a crucifixion that day, you know that you will need a grave ready before sundown. And that gives you plenty of time to arrange that. 
And second, crucifixion was meant to be shameful. And on top of that, Jesus wasn't just an ordinary crucified criminal. He was crucified specifically as a royal pretender, challenging the Roman imperial rule. And if it's really the case that Joseph's request for a private burial was out of the ordinary, and that the default procedure was a suitably shameful grave burial in a criminal graveyard, then Pontius Pilate, of all people, was precisely the kind of Roman governor who would not grant that. Judging from what we know about Pilate's ruthlessness and buffoonery from extra-biblical descriptions of his behavior towards Judeans. So the way that Jesus is buried in the Gospels isn't impossible, but it's not massively historically plausible either. But it kind of makes sense as a plot device, because it's exactly the kind of tomb that you as a Gospel writer might want to depict if you write a narrative about Jesus' body going missing. It's sealed with a stone, so you can have your literary characters wondering who will roll the stone away. It has enough space inside to enter and find someone or something there and so on. So that's the first reason. And the second reason why I don't think that we know Jesus was buried the way depicted in the Gospels is because a missing body is a literary trope of divine translation narratives. And what I mean by that is that specifically in Mediterranean antiquity, so in that place and time where the belief in Jesus' resurrection originated, there were narratives about figures who were taken from the earthly realm to a divine realm, where they were highly exalted and they now exist as divine beings. In some cases, it happens while they are still alive. In other cases, it happens after their death. Sometimes these figures are deified, so they actually become divine beings. And sometimes they are already divine. For example, they are sons of gods, they are incarnations of pre-existing divine beings, and so on. And they are usually worshipped as divine beings afterwards. And these narratives often include elements of the divine being returning back among ordinary people to do various things. For example, to reveal themselves to people, to give instructions, to fight, eat, have sex, and produce children, and so on. And in these translation narratives, there is a very common trope of physical disappearance. Sometimes these figures disappear while they are still alive. And in other cases, their body disappears after they die. And what's important is that people in the ancient world were already aware that this is a trope and that these kinds of narratives about missing bodies implying divine exaltation belong to the same category. So when, for example, Plutarch describes divine translation of Romulus, he says that this is like the fables which the Greek tell about other figures, and he mentions some of them. And if this is something that's interesting for you, there is a great paper by a scholar named Richard Miller. It's called Mark's Empty Tomb and Other Translation Fables in Classical Antiquity, which shows how common these kinds of narratives were, and it lists literally dozens of examples both Greek, Roman, and Jewish. Some of them are about mythological characters, uh, but others are about historical people. And again, you will find a link to that article in the video description. The reason why I'm talking about it, of course, is that the empty tomb narrative in the Gospels fits this pattern as well. Of course, this consideration cuts both ways. So it could be the case that there already was the belief in Jesus' resurrection, so it made sense to depict his body as missing to indicate his divinity. But it could also be the case that Jesus' body actually went missing, and that's how the belief in his resurrection started. Uh, That's why I said it's easy to explain it if you think there was an empty tomb. And because it could be either way, we can't really say we know that the burial accounts in the Gospels are what actually happened in history, and it's not just another example of this specific uh, literary trope. As with Joseph Arimathea, I find it unlikely that early Christians would have invented the story that features uh, women. I uh, I know that there are responses to that and retorts, and it goes back and forth. But again, at the end of the day, uh, I think if this had been an invention, then uh, Peter would have discovered the empty tomb. So this is an old argument from embarrassment. Basically, the idea is that the discovery of the tomb, specifically by women, as opposed to men, is unlikely as an invention because women were considered less trustworthy than men, and so on. So a literary author inventing historical fiction would be more likely to invent a discovery by men 
maybe even by someone in position of authority like Peter. But I think that Discovery by Women specifically fits very nicely with the theme of reversal of expectations, which we see everywhere in the Gospel of Mark, which is where this narrative first shows up. In the Gospel of Mark, nothing is ever as it seems. And what you would expect to happen usually doesn't happen. And what happens instead is what you would least expect. Let me give you some examples of what I I mean. So in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus doesn't come from a place or position of political power. Instead, he comes from an insignificant town in Galilee. He doesn't try to become famous. Instead, he actively tries to hide his message. He doesn't take credit for his miracles. And instead, he instructs people not to tell anyone. He associates with people who are normally rejected from the religious community, like sinners and tax collectors. And he uses his miracles to help people who are rejected by society, like lepers. His male disciples, who are the closest to him, are precisely the ones who don't understand who he is. And instead, people who know who he is are outsiders, enemies and marginalized groups. Who is it who knows exactly, immediately, and perfectly clearly who Jesus is in the Gospel of Mark? The demons, of course. Jesus' own family doesn't understand him. They think that he's crazy. And in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is buried by a member of the governing body that has just condemned him to death. Uh, You know, elsewhere in the video, Alison says that Christians would be unlikely to invent Jesus being buried by a Sanhedrinist. But that's exactly the kind of thing that's all over the Gospel of Mark. In the Gospel, the one person who says, truly this man was the Son of God, is a Roman centurion who has just finished crucifying him. And of course, Jesus himself, in the Gospel of Mark, teaches the reversal of existing power structures. This entire theme of reversal of expectations is very nicely summed up in the one sentence, the first shall be last. So in light of this persistent literary theme, the discovery of of the tomb, specifically by women, makes perfect sense. Because Jesus' male disciples, the ones who are with him from the very very beginning and who are supposed to understand him the best, they end up being the seed that falls on rocky ground. They betray him, they abandon him, and they deny him. In the Gospel of Mark, the young man inside the tomb tells the women, go tell his disciples and Peter. Meaning that at the end of the Gospel of Mark, Peter isn't even counted among Jesus' disciples because he denied Jesus. And so it makes sense that the only ones that are left around to discover the empty tomb and the only ones to learn about Jesus' resurrection are precisely the ones that are the last, the ones that are the least expected, the women. And of course, the final reversal of expectations in the Gospel of Mark, the final sucker punch, the culmination of the entire Gospel, is that the women are instructed to proclaim Jesus' resurrection, but instead they run away because they are afraid and they say nothing to anyone. And Alison goes on very correctly to point out how later Gospel authors, who were more concerned with credibility of the narrative, try to fix this. For example, by adding Peter and the beloved disciple, confirming the discovery of the empty tomb. And this, of course, doesn't make sense if you think that all of that is history. Because then, why would both Mark and Matthew completely shoot themselves in the foot and omit the confirmation of the discovery by men and only depict discovery by women if it's really the case that the discovery by women was so embarrassing? Doesn't make any sense. And of course, the reason why the Gospel of Mark doesn't have any problem describing the tomb as discovered by women doesn't have to be necessarily because that's what actually happened in history. Another perfectly good option is that the author just doesn't care about his being, uh, this being embarrassing. And I would argue this is more probable because it fits so neatly with this theme of reversal of expectations that we see everywhere else in the Gospel of Mark. I'm not too far away from where Dale is on this. And in fact, in my, my 2010 book, the big book on the resurrection, here's how I defined resurrection for the resurrection hypothesis. Following a supernatural event of an indeterminate nature and cause, Jesus appeared to a number of people in individual and group settings. So now we have moved to the topic of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. And again, just like with the trope of a missing body indicating divinity, we see appearances of divine beings all over ancient Mediterranean literature. They were appearing to groups and individuals. They were appearing in people's sleep as well as when they were awake. I could name a number of examples. Sailors passing by the mouth of Istros were reporting seeing Achilles exercising in his armor. 
uh, divine beings were appearing in battles and during sieges of cities, uh, fighting alongside soldiers. There were ancient historians who reported that a god appeared to Hannibal and show hi showed him a passage through the Alps. One ancient author writes, I have seen Asclepius and not in a dream. I have seen Heracles in waking reality. There is, for example, a nice inscription that we found outside the city of Miletus, which says, the gods have been appearing in visitations as never before to the girls and women, but also to men and children. We have various accounts of how the gods personally participate in their religious festivals, and they even leave behind physical evidence of their presence and so on. And th this was apparently so common that ordinary people were sometimes mistaken for divine beings. And this abundance of appearances is true about Jesus as well. Jesus never actually stopped appearing to people when the biblical canon was closed. This is something that Alison actually points out elsewhere in this video. There have always been narratives about Jesus' appearances, and not just in non-canonical gospels and acts of apostles. Uh, there are even entire subgenres of these narratives. For example, one which was particularly popular in uh, European Middle Ages is about a main character traveling and meeting a person in need on the road. The main character helps them, and then it's revealed that the person in need was actually Jesus. But when it comes to the New Testament, which is probably where Christian apologists would want to go for their evidence, we can split the relevant passages roughly into four categories. The vision of John of Patmos in the book of Revelation, Jesus interacting with people after his death in the Gospels and Acts, Jesus appearing to Paul as described in his authentic letters, and then Jesus appearing to other people mentioned in a pre-Pauline creed in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, Lycona and Alison don't really discuss the book of Revelation in this video, and they don't really talk about the Gospels and Acts that much either, which is apparently a shame because some people in the comment section voiced their dissatisfaction with this and argued that a Christian apologist should defend the historicity of the appearance narratives specifically in Gospels and Acts, because if it's really the case that there were people in first century Palestine who sincerely believed that they lived with the resurrected Jesus for 40 days, well, then you're not going to explain that with a hallucination, right? So let me just say a few words about it, even though it's not covered in this video. When it comes to the various appearance narratives of Jesus in Gospels and Acts, these also fit very neatly into how appearances, uh, appearances of divine beings were depicted in ancient literature, uh, so much so that we can even identify specific tropes which the Gospels and Acts share in common with these extra-biblical examples. There is often a motif of hidden identity, there is some initial cognitive resistance by the people, there is a display of a token, then there is the moment of recognition, there is often a sudden disappearance of the divine being, the participants are some are sometimes incapacitated in some way because the theophany is just impossible for ordinary people to withstand and so on. And I will again leave recommendations for some academic literature on this in the video description. And more specifically, I've already mentioned the various Greek, Roman, and Jewish narratives of divine translation, in which the divine being often appears in the earthly realm, often to reveal what happened to them and to give instructions. And of course, there are always differences between these narratives and what we have narrated about Jesus in Gospels and Acts. For example, in case of Jesus, this is combined with other existing Jewish beliefs, and that's why, for example, Jesus is said to be raised from the dead and not, let's say, described as heros, which is a technical term in Greek religious thought and is often used in this context. But, of course, other divine translation narratives are also different from each other. So this level of cross-case variability is entirely expected. The key point is that there is enough familial resemblance of the actual concept to completely justify the belief that what we have in the Gospels and Acts is the same sort of literary creation that was perfectly normal, again, in this specific region of the world and in this specific period of time where the belief in Jesus' resurrection originated. And of course, modern scholars are not the first ones to recognize this. Early critics of Christianity were quick to point this out, uh, for example, Celsus or Celsus, and early Christians were aware of this as well. Justin Martyr, for example, famously says, when we affirm that Jesus Christ died, 
rose and ascended to heaven. We say nothing different from what you believe about those you call the sons of Zeus. Mm -hmm. Let me pull back to one of the biggest evidences that is given for uh, the resurrection is the appearance to Paul. Ah, so this brings us to Paul and his connection to uh, the Lord. And again, I think it's important to situate Paul in his appropriate uh, cultural context, because sometimes when people talk about Paul in these kinds of discussions, they it almost sounds like we are talking about someone living today. Oh, Paul, what did he saw? So uh, Paul specifically was a freelance religious specialist who brought a foreign Near Eastern deity to Greece. And he established cultic associations devoted to the worship of this deity. He was someone who modified ritual requirements of the deity so that they became more in line with the Greek lifestyle. He was someone who claimed that he was uh, selected or set apart by the deity. He claimed that he experienced an epiphany of the deity, uh, that he visited heaven and gained some secret knowledge there, that he possesses this previously hidden knowledge about the divine and about what happens after death. He was someone who practiced divination, uh, so he interpreted divine signs and wonders. He uh, practiced speaking in tongues, various works of divine power, for example, healing. And he practiced, of course, divine discernments of literary texts. And he promised his followers various divine gifts as a result of loyalty to his God, which, of course, included achieving immortality after death and power in the divine realm through transmutation of the human body into a better, more reified material. And he used all the normal vocabulary of uh, these religious specialists, as well as technical terms of first century natural philosophy. Uh, this isn't particularly extraordinary in Mediterranean antiquity. And we have uh, quite a lot of attestations about people like Paul, even though we usually don't have their own writings, and uh, we often even don't know their names. It's almost always attestations by critics. For example, authors like Plato, Plutarch, uh, Theophrastos, uh, and so on, criticize them. Uh, there are satirists like Lucian, who famously makes uh, fun of these kinds of people, and so on. These freelance religious specialists were often on the fringes of the ancient religious landscape, and they often had ambiguous relationships with the rest of the society. So on one hand, they were often targets of ridicule, suspicion, or even outright persecution. But on the other hand, there was always a demand for this kind of non-traditional spirituality, especially by the first century, and especially when it comes to exotic religious ideas that were coming from various regions in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. And these people were often presented as being in communication with their god. For example, we have inscriptions with foundational narratives of various cultic associations in Greece, in which a god appears to an unsuspecting person, instructs them to establish a cult. There's sometimes a motif of some initial resistance or disbelief from the person, which the god, of course, is able to overcome. And in some cases, there is even an element of hostility from the outsiders, which the founder of the cult must endure. So for someone like Paul, who was going around Greece and establishing associations for worship of this new Judean deity, it's not particularly unusual to claim that he was called by the deity to do this and that he receives instructions from this deity. And of course, there have been various theories to put, for put forward about, you know, Paul's mental health and so on, that would make him talking about Jesus in his letters more plausible to people in the 21st century. But I don't really think there's any need for that. Let me give you an analogy. Imagine that you meet someone today and they tell you they are spiritual but not religious, and then they start talking about things like uh, cosmic energies, uh, karma, uh, healing crystals, meditation, uh, channeling spirits, astral projection, and so on. In that case, you don't need to posit that they are schizotypal or that they have epilepsy to explain where these beliefs come from, right? Just like you don't need it to explain why a first century religious leader talks about being chosen by a god, having a close personal contact with him, visiting heaven and revealing mysteries about how to achieve immortality. The kinds of things that Paul is talking about in his letters are just as explicable in terms of first century Mediterranean religious beliefs as what New Age people talk about today is explicable 
in terms of 21st century Western alternative spirituality. And of course, the issue with Paul is that he never really describes what he means when he says things like, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? So there isn't really that much that we can say about it. Apparently, it wasn't that uncommon because a lot of people saw Jesus in some way, including apparently 500 people at one time. And Paul seems to have some sort of technique to induce an appearance of Jesus in other people. Because at one point he says to the Galatians, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly exhibited as crucified, referring to something that happened when he was with them. About Apart from that, there isn't much else. It's often assumed that when Paul says that he's seen Jesus, we should imagine the kinds of appearances that we see in the Gospels and in Acts. But Paul never says that. It's often assumed that Paul was experiencing sustained appearances of the Lord throughout his missionary life. But again, that's not in evidence either. And a lot of scholars think that, for example, when Paul cites the Lord as a source, for example, for some ethical instruction, is actually talking about oral traditions coming from the historical Jesus. And it could also be the case that Paul practiced some kind of divination technique to discern the will of the Lord. But again, we don't have any details. One scholar, for example, says, we could be confident that Paul probably didn't read from animal entrails, but that's about it. And it's often assumed that Paul became a devotee of the Lord because of some kind of visionary experience. But that's actually not in evidence either. And there has been a lot of other suggestions. Uh, For example, I've seen it suggested in literature that what might have shaken Paul's convictions was him seeing how Gentiles practice speaking in tongues. Of course, that's entirely speculative and we don't have any evidence for it. Uh, But hey, add it to the list of all of the other possible explanations. So there's what I think I think we can draw a really, really solid conclusion from based on the data, and then what I might be more inclined to believe. And I'm more inclined to believe that the appearance to the more than 500. So this leaves us with Jesus being seen by other people in 1 Corinthians 15. And here, like Ona's argument is that Paul believed that Jesus was raised from the dead physically. Mm-hmm. He probably got that belief from the Jerusalem apostles which means they believe that Jesus was raised from the dead physically, and they believed it because that what they experience. So an encounter with physically raised Jesus, as opposed to just a vision or just a dream or just an apparition. But that, of course, doesn't follow. Alison himself points out in this video that there already was a pre-existing Jewish belief in the resurrection involving physical bodies which leave behind empty tombs. And I've already talked about how many of the divine translation narratives involve a physical disappearance, a disappearance of a physical body. So it's actually super easy to explain why Paul or the Jerusalem apostles or anyone else would believe that Jesus was raised bodily. That was just what people believed about these kinds of things back then. You don't need to postulate that someone actually handled Jesus' resurrected body to explain it. You know, as I argue in one chapter of the book, I I think we should pay some attention to the fact that Christians down through the ages have had visions of, of Jesus, and it still goes on. And most of those people who have visions of Jesus think that he rose from the dead and think that the tomb was empty and that he rose bodily, but they will still have no trouble saying that Jesus appeared to them and Uh, that for them, this is proof that he is still alive. Uh, So I I think once you you believe in the resurrection, that you can take appearances as confirmation that Jesus still lives. So this is a really important point. A lot of people assume that what convinced the first person, whoever that might have been, that Jesus didn't just die like else, must have been some kind of an experience of seeing Jesus. In other words, the assumption is that the appearances caused the belief in the resurrection, or at least that they were a necessary cause. And it's not difficult to guess why people make that assumption, because that's how it's portrayed in the Gospels, right? In the Gospels, Jesus' disciples are absolutely clueless about what's going on, and it takes an appearance of the resurrected Jesus to get them to understand. 
which again fits very nicely with how these uh, divine appearances are often narrated in antiquity. And Allison thinks that the appearances caused the belief in Jesus' resurrection, at least in the few initial cases, presumably of Jesus' own disciples, because he elsewhere in the video says that what's necessary to explain the belief in Jesus' resurrection is the empty tomb, the appearances, and the pre-existing Jewish concept of a resurrection. But he thinks that when it comes to other people who became convinced that Jesus appeared to them later, including people who think that today, that might also be explained the other way around. So they already believe that Jesus was raised, so they interpreted, uh, interpret any experiences they might have in light of that belief, and as a further confirmation of that belief. And where I differ from Alison, and actually a lot of scholars agree with me, <laughs> is that it very well might have been the case that the belief in Jesus' resurrection came first, and only then some people became convinced that they experience some sort of encounter with Jesus. And it's not difficult to explain where the belief in Jesus' resurrection came from, absent the empty tomb and absent any appearances. Because after all, there was the religious category of divine translation already in place, and various New Testament texts actually explicitly tell us how Jesus' resurrection was reverse-engineered by reinterpreting various passages in the Hebrew Bible in light of this existing concept of divine translation. After all, for example, Isaiah literally says that the servant will be lifted up and exalted. And of course, the alternative model that the belief in resurrection came first and the appearances came after has the added advantage that on this model, the first adopters of the belief in the resurrection would be primed to look for confirmations of that belief especially given that they lived in a culture where narratives of divine translation often already included an element of the deity confirming its divine translation in some way. And I think this expectation massively lowers the bar for how amazing any religious experience would have to be then interpreted as an experience of the risen Jesus and taken as a confirmation that the belief in the resurrection is actually true. In other words, if there were people in first century Palestine who already believed that Jesus was raised from the dead and who were predisposed to expect to see it confirmed, then it's entirely reasonable to expect that they would mistake something that they, for example, saw in the sky for an appearance of Jesus, which is what Allison proposes in this video as well as in his book. And if this is what happened, then maybe Cephas saw it first, then the 12, then more than 500 people saw it, then James saw it, then the apostles, and then 20 years later, Paul had a weird dream once, and the rest is history. By the way, those of you watching, I would love to have you join us at uh, Biola. We've got the top rated distance apologetics program. <laughs> uh, think about Wrong. joining us. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I'd love to, but Biola requires that you be a Christian before you arrive. So I can't. Make sure you hit subscribe. Have other conversations coming on. Indeed. Please subscribe to my channel. And more importantly, find links in the description of where you can find Camille and his long-form, carefully considered scholarly analysis of Christian apologetics that I know you will appreciate. My pleasure, Sean. Thank you. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. So, Camille, thank you so much for being here. That was very insightful. Love it. Thank you. Happy to come again. Tell Apologia sent you, and I'll see you over there. Later. Okay. Yeah, bye. Thanks, bye. Thank you.